the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Sometimes I like to shout, play ball. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but we're about to play some ball right now. Um, so I am Megan Barth. I am the founding editor of the Nevada Globe. We cover policy and politics throughout the state of Nevada. Uh, in full disclosure, I live in Las Vegas. However, I spend about six months out of the year up in Washoe County. Um, when it's 120 degrees, I tend to escape from Las Vegas <laughs> and <laughs> come up here. Um, we thought it was very important uh, to do a debate for the biggest little city in the world. And the biggest little city in the world has many of the same problems that Las Vegas does. Um, we are all experiencing uh, inflationar uh, inflationary prices, um, recessive times. Uh, with that comes a rise in crime, uh, a rise in homelessness, uh, economy, jobs, etc. And these are all issues that are plaguing many cities, including Reno. Uh, we extended the debate invitation to Mayor Hillary Sheev. Uh, I emailed her, I called her office. Um, I emailed her office and called her office uh, and did not receive a response. Uh, however, I, we did receive a response via Instagram, um, which she publicly posted on her Instagram page yesterday at about noon. And um, if you don't mind, I'll read you that statement because I think it's fair. She put it out in the public in case you did not see it. And, of course, I need my glasses. There they are. I'm surprised I'm not sitting on them. <laughs> uh, so this is from the Instagram page of uh, Mayor Hillary Sheev. It says, there is a lot of spin going around that I'll be attending a debate on October 27th. I would like to clarify that I am not attending any event. For the record, I agreed to a Nevada newsmaker RGJ debate, but my opponent declined. As you are aware, this is the time of year that political campaigns like to spin the truth, along with an abundance of mudslinging. I have chosen to uh, stay sed steadfast in my positive campaign style because nothing is accomplished for our community by adding dirty and divisive politics. Sorry if you were spun into believing any such event would take place. Let's keep it clean, Reno. Enthusiastically, Hillary. So with that said, and, and she has every right to um, deny our invitation, obviously, uh, but I've been working in debates for many, many years. I've moderated debates, uh, and I promise to keep it clean. Uh, but this will be the opportunity, I believe, for you to understand her positions. What we've done in the last 24 hours is our team has put together all of her public statements on the issues that impact Reno the most. Crime, homelessness, et cetera, the economy, the budget, uh, the new public safety building we'll be talking about as well. Um, and so we've compiled her statements, so we will have her answers or her statements for you to understand what her position has been publicly and what's been published by her publicly. And with that, we will then turn over uh, the question uh, of the issue to George Eddie Lorton. Do you prefer I call you Eddie or George Eddie Lorton? Well, I don't want him to get confused on the ballot. I'm George Eddie Lorton. That's so. what I figured. Okay. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Um, so that's who I am, Megan Barth, founding editor of the Nevada Globe. You can find us at thenevadaglobe.com, and I encourage you to read uh, the Nevada Globe for your daily dose of Nevada politics, policy, and news. And I'll turn it over to you, Eddie. I've got two Eddies on the stage. You're welcome. I'm on the air, right? You are, um, oh, you're thank live. you very much. Hey, I'm Eddie Floyd. I'm the founder and a show host for America Matters Media, and uh, I'm honored to be here in front of all of you tonight to have this debate to Hillary, our mayor, and to Eddie Lorton. Oh, I'm sorry, George Eddie Lorton. It's a bad habit I've got to call him Eddie Lorton after all these years. But so I'm looking forward to this, and if anybody has any questions or anything, just yell them out at me when I'm up. 
Um, and we've also taken questions on note cards um, from the audience. And so if you have a note card, um, if you could just pass it to the end of the aisle and either one of, uh, uh, either I or Eddie or uh, someone will come up and hand it uh, to us. So uh, whatever works best for you in case we missed any. Okay, so with that said, let's start um, the debate. So we're going to talk about the background and qualifications to be mayor. Um, Hillary is on record stating, as a lifelong resident of Reno, Hillary has said she's attended Reno High School, loves our city, and the people who live here. She's held elected office for 10 years, eight years as mayor and two years as city council member, and says she has improved our affordable housing, infrastructure, and our economy. She is a registered nonpartisan and says she is there for all the people in Reno. As the owner of two local businesses, she says she understands how to help small business owners and has been successful in reducing the bureaucratic red tape it takes to run a business. Hillary, uh, Mayor Sheeve says she takes pride in having reinvented and revitalized downtown Reno, making it a place that attracts residents, visitors, businesses, and students. Mayor Sheeve says she is a big supporter of the arts and of culture and has been an innovative leader in improving Reno's economy through the arts. She says she has played a major role in transforming Reno into a hub for tech op entrepreneurs and other Silicon Valley type businesses. So I will ask you, George Eddie Lorton. Yes. What is your, or excuse me, let me start with your intro. I forgot that. So okay. please introduce yourself to the audience and we'll go into that answer. Well, first off, I'm George Eddie Lorton running for Reno Mayor. Thanks for coming tonight. I appreciate you very much. It's nice to see everybody here. And, and secondly, I would like to straighten out this debate situation. Um, we've had many people in the room. She's been offered five or six different debates, and she even skipped every single forum from the Hidden Valley Forum, Homeowners Association, and then they had a senior forum. She didn't show up. Anytime I'm in the room, she won't show up, but then she showed up for one for the chamber because we were separate. So I do want to make that perfectly clear. And then the other time, though, she, after the RGJ and KOLO asked if we'd do a debate in front of uh, 25 to 40,000 people, I said I would love to talk policies and issues in front of the citizens. They deserve that. Count me in. So then 10 minutes later, they called me and said, she said no. So when I do a debate, I want to do it live in front of audience members that we're going to represent, because after all, if we're representing you, don't you want to see if we're quick on our feet or good at what we do and hear answers out of our mouth instead of being scripted and written down and all these things? So that's what I wanted. So then she would only do one little debate in a studio of a real good, good friend, Sam Chad, and they've even said it on the air, why would I put myself in that position? So I thought about it, but then there were some other moderators that I knew, so I was like two hours or three hours late on the deadline, which you could see Nevada newsmakers, and I explained it there, and I said, we'll do it, and then it was like three or four days after that, and then she said no, even with her own moderators, own place and everything, so I wanted to be clear on that from her little message, but you know, as you notice, she hasn't been here for the last two years since riots, and she claims that she's been good for business owners. She shut them all down. She's been nowhere to be seen for the last two years, told our police to stand down while they kicked the windows in. I would never do that. We're gonna enforce the law, clean up the homeless problem, and I'm not gonna be in the pocket of developers, and that's a promise for me to you. And now, as we see, she must have something better to do, but it's not speak in front of the citizens, and I'm here for you, and thanks for being here tonight. George Eddie Lorton, Reno Mayor, thank you. And I just wanted to add that um, this morning I did do an article and published on the Nevada Globe um, where she claims that he had turned down the debates. So I did call George Eddie Lorton yesterday and said, is this true? Um, and he provided me email proof that he actually did accept the RGJ debate um, within an hour, I believe, of, of the reporter um, emailing him. So um, he did not turn down that debate, and according to um, George Eddie Lorton, he did not turn down the Nevada Newsmakers debate. 
So I did see the email, and you can see the email published on the Nevada Globe. And I'm here tonight. And you're here tonight, so thank you. So tell the audience a little bit. We gave Hillary's qualifications. Um, what is your background and your qualifications to lead the biggest little city in the world? Well, I thank you for that. Well, I had to go to 30 years of meetings to protect my investments. I own businesses from small to large. I built it up from the ground up. I'm 60 years old. I had nothing and built it into where we have a giant recycling plant today. So I have numerous businesses, real estate in three states. We've done concerts and tours. Uh, we've gone to auctions. We've done shows. I've done a lot of things in my lifetime, and I don't need a job. I do this because I care. This town turned into a shell of what it once was. If you go downtown, do you feel safe? I did my commercials. Murder rates went up 100%. Rape went up 50%. And then they tried to spin it on Channel 4, and then there were two murders the next week and one on the city hall doorstep. So we need to clean up this town, enforce the law, deal with this homeless issue, and quit being in the pocket of developers like these people are. So I'm going to clean this town up, and we're going to move forward in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Eddie. All right. What we're going to do now, but before we get started, I want to thank everybody for coming. What do you think about this guy, George Eddie Lorden? Come on. All right. And, and let's also save a little round of applause for the most conservative senator that I've ever known here in the great state of Nevada, Senator Don Gustafson. Don, stand up, buddy. All right. And Don, who are you supporting? <laughs> all right, all right. George Eddie Lorton. All right. And by the way, thank you, Megan, for this question. She gave me the first question, number two, it's on crime. I'm qualified, okay? Let's do it. Crime and law enforcement, based on FBI statistics and the rising incidence of violent crimes, a national publication ranks Reno as number one most dangerous city in Nevada. What do you believe is causing this? And how would you stop it? Well, there's no response, so we'll go to George Eddie Lorton. Well, I think it all starts at City Hall, and it's their soft on crime policies that created from more crime and it's being more dangerous and more homeless all from their soft on crime policies, which could be very clearly understood when the riots, they told them to stand down while they kicked the windows in. They went over to the police station, graffitied the police station, kicked the windows in on the cars. That's very disrespectful. Well, I paid to turn the arch lights blue ever since 2010 for our fallen police because our city wouldn't pay. So I support our police, and we're going to enforce the law to where everybody wants equity and equality. Well, I'm going to give it to them. If you're homeless and throw trash in the river, you're going to get a ticket or arrested just like I would if I pulled in my motor home and threw trash in there. So we're going to give them all the equality we want. We're going to enforce the law equally, and we're going to straighten this out, bring crime rates down. Do you realize, and sorry, I'm going to be long-winded on this one. No problem. Well, back in 2005, we had 400 officers on the streets, okay, and lately they're bragging they hired. Well, guess how many we have today? 347 officers on the streets, and our population has exploded. So people are retiring quicker than they're hiring them. Then they want to do diversity hiring. A lot of them are dropping out after we spend all this time and money on it, where I just want the best people to be hired that are going to enforce the law and represent Reno well and be fair and good to all citizens so we're safe. So me knowing what I know, how to cut, we're going to sell off city-owned properties. I'm a businessman. They can't, I know more about this city than all them put together. I had to go for 30 years to protect my investments. So we're gonna sell off city-owned properties. There's a long plan I have. Quit subsidizing the ballpark a million a year, subsidizing developers, okay, so that we can get more police on the streets and we can be safe and deal with this homeless issue. And that's a promise. Uh, and I will read Mayor Sheev's position on, on crime and um, law enforcement. Uh, Mayor Sheev, and, and again, these are this is a statement that we compiled from public statements, so this isn't her official statement. Uh, Mayor Sheev says that stopping crime and public safety is her top priority. She says that one way she has fought rising crime is by hiring more police officers. 
She says that, uh, she, she notes that every year since she took office, the number of RPD officers has either stayed the same or increased. Do you have a response to that? Well, if they increase, go to the record. 2005, we had 400. Today, we have 347. So more retire than they pay, because when police don't feel like they're being supported, they quit and they retire. So if you're telling them to stand down and 38 officers get hurt and people are retiring, as a matter of fact, I'll give you a prime example. Our chief is retiring at the end of the year. So I love case and example. So let's count it up, go to the graphs. We've decreased and increased population. So, and look at the murder rates, went up 100%. The proof is in the pudding. So that's what I say. So. I don't believe that. They can paint a beautiful picture for you. Everything's fine and great as they're dunking in the river to try to gain votes. Well, I wouldn't go in that river, would you? So I don't believe any of it. So thank you for that question. Um, that was a good segue because this is my question and we're into high level appointments. Uh, in 2015, uh, Chief Jason Soto was appointed by Mayor Sheev and the council as Reno's new police chief. However, Soto required two years of training to qualify as Reno's official chief. During Soto's tenure as chief, Reno's crime has increased, and the city now is ranked as the most dangerous city in Nevada. Uh, Mayor Sheev has vocally supported uh, the chief since her appointment and the council's appointment. Um, Hillary stated months ago that she felt Soto was doing a tremendous job. She also added, prior to that, excuse me, I missed that part, um, when she was um, in an open discussion with city council members, she noted that the idea that Soto's appointment was politically motivated is ridiculous. There was some chatter uh, around the water cooler and around Reno, obviously, that the, the appointment of Chief Soto was political, politically motivated due to the fact that Soto was the head of the police union, had raised money for Hillary's campaign, um, as well as encourage the endorsement. Uh, with Police Chief Soto retiring at the end of the year, um, what do you think about the appointment process that resulted in Soto's being hired as police chief and the job he has done? And this is a two-part question. Well, as we see with council members, they brought appointing to a whole new art form, haven't they? They've taken it out of the public's hands, but that'll be another discussion. But That's now, coming up, so don't ruin it. Okay, <laughs> perfect. So now when it comes to appointing a chief, well, I believe hire within. Every time they go to these outside people to hire from someone from California like Pullman, he lasted a few years, he left, and they don't know what Reno is, so we should hire from within. And they should be qualified. So this is touchy ground for me. Because Jason, I've known for a long time since he was the manager at Toys R Us. So, you know, you can look at the statistics and without me being saying anything bad and be classy about it. So they should hire people that are qualified from day one, but the chief's a nice man, and I can leave it at that because I want to be classy. Okay? Keep it classy. Yes, ma'am. Uh, second part of the question, as mayor... How would you handle appointing a new chief of police, a city manager, or any of the top city positions? Well, first off, it should be the vote of the council, not certain people lobbying for certain people. And you know, it's the rest of the council's problem to allow politics to infiltrate, same with our schooling, into what their jobs are. So if I'm gonna hire people, it's a job interview process. You sit them down, you see who's the most qualified, you don't put politics in it, and you hire the best qualified person that's gonna do the job. Like when it came to the city manager, he was an assistant city manager out of Sparks, and he's in the developer's pocket, he represented a lot of developers, and then we bring him on in from Sparks, and he makes 230000 a year as standard pay for a city manager in the city of Reno. And then all of a sudden, we're, we're almost a billion dollars in debt here, and they turn around and give him, at your expense, a $100,000 a year raise. Does that make sense to you when they're closing senior citizens or senior uh, places down there at Teglias Park, they're closing senior centers and giving this guy $100,000 a year raise on your dime. Does that make any sense? Not to me. So we're going to hire the best people, but we are going to be 
budget friendly and conscious, so I'm gonna be able to make us more money, we're gonna sort it out, because I am a business analyst and a forensics auditor, so we're, I have the tools for the job, we're gonna straighten it out, cut the fat, and spend our money on what we're supposed to. It's police, fire, and public works. That's their only job, not scooters. Uh, I think that's, I was supposed to go to this next question, but I kind of want to jump. Okay. I can do that. <laughs> um, let's talk about, since we were kind of talking about the police chief um, and the rise of crime and, it, and Reno being one of the most dangerous cities, um, we have this public safety building. And in full disclosure, um, the Nevada Globe had a whistleblower that came forward and told us, me specifically, that the building was $14 million over budget. Now, just so you're aware, the Public Safety Building is going to be the new police headquarters. It's renamed the Public Safety Building because it will also have other services for the community um, specific to domestic violence and mental health, et cetera. Um, the building was purchased a few years ago, I believe. Yes. Uh, a few years ago for $7 million, and that's not part of the original $34.5 million budget. Um, the building sits right on the river. It was purchased for $7 million from the RGJ. And the most recent report that I could find was September. And the public, um, I would call her the project manager over the project, stated that phase one had cost uh, $20 million so far. Um, phase one is supposed to be completed in mid-spring, um, and then phase two begins. Um, so the original budget for phase one was 19 million. So for her publicly admitting it was 20 million, I knew it was at least a million dollars over budget thus far. So I wrote the city, and I wrote Carrie Costco, who's the project manager of, of this building, uh, her and her engineering team, and I asked her a host of questions. Um, I did not get a response ex from, directly from her, but she did refer me to another woman um, in the city, or a, a phone number. And a woman from the city called me back, and she has a whole list of my questions. However, yesterday well, there was a city council meeting. Now the budget, and you may not know this, this might be news to you, it might be news to all of you, um, the budget for the public safety building is now $70 million. Doubled. And that was published in This Is Reno. Um, I just saw that on my way to the debate. Um, it is $70 million. And they extended the time period of the completion to sometime in 2024. Um, so with that said, um, I would like your response to that. Thank you for that question, Megan. Well, from day one, I'm a real estate expert. I wrote this city a property disposal program with policies. I found 150 more pieces than the city even knew they owned. Talk about the incompetence. And part of those were really nice empty lots, stuff like that. So from day one I lobbied because I think they did it a favor for the Gazette Journal, so they bought it out. And then Mr. Mike Clark back here, he's running for county commission. He is our assessor, and he also, wave a mic, yes sir. Well, he was also against it publicly, and so was I. And he's our assessor, because you want, you want best use out of the building, stuff like that. So they bought it from the Gazette Journal, which why would you give a property worth a lot on the river, which is our jewel, going through the downtown core, why would we buy that to do a public safety building? Plus, I know construction. The roof's been leaking for years and years and years. They have mold and asbestos issues. I call that uncontrollable variables. So I would never buy into that. We had a free piece of property through those other 650 pieces. We could have built a state of the art from the ground up, not had mold, asbestos, leaky roofs. And then also, Megan, in that, in that article you mentioned, well, guess what? They found rusted out beams in that building, and our mayor, now all of a sudden they come out with this because the globe caught them red-handed through this person on the fact that they were all this money over budget randomly out of nowhere on phase one, and they got five phases, found the rusted beams, and Hillary told them to paint over them and gave everybody at the city a gag order, and that's why she can't get information. That's how corrupt it is, one of the many things that she's done to this town. And so it's funny how elections work. So they want to keep it quiet till afterward, but somebody had honor and gave them a call. So I thank them for that. 
Yeah, and we try to, you know, I, I never disclose sources, I never burn a source, um, but what I can tell you is that it's a it's city source, um, and very knowledgeable, um, involved, and um, when I read today that, and I have not gotten a, a response back from the city, um, but the, the council did approve uh, a new budget of $70 million, and that happened last night, and that's an estimate that is an estimate. So it was the 14 million over and they just taped it on the backside. I mean, I'm a numbers guy and so that's what they do. They cover it up and keep rolling. The allegations, we did have a photographer that was able to access the building. You can look at the, the article on the nevadaglobe.com. You can see the rusted beams, so those are verified by pictures. Um, I could not obviously verify the allegation that she told them to cover it up. Uh, but nonetheless, um, those were the allegations made from a a reliable source um, and uh, lastly um, you know due to this this budget now this new budget um, and due to our work at the globe and our sources um, that the globe was provided with they've now put security around the building so you can't get into the building and we can't ask any more questions at least now of the people at the site um, we'll have to keep working through the city um, and challenging the city to provide us answers to our many questions. And then they won't answer them, right? Well, I'm giving them plenty of time. I, okay. I, I'm going to give them, uh, well, a week. Um, I sent the email on Monday. Um, so tomorrow is a business week. I'll be calling the same person tomorrow and checking in. Uh, I have some of the information now from the city council meeting. However, there is other information I think that the public deserves t to know. That's our public money. We deserve to know everything. So that's why I'm here. I believe in transparency, and I will work for you, unlike them. And that's a promise. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good job, Betty. Thanks, All right, sir. let's uh, go right now to homelessness, part one. The homeless problem in Reno continues to grow. The population doubled last year, and the money the city spends on it is in the tens of millions of dollars annually. A new 900 bed, $17 million homeless tent shelter for, was, it was built last year. It rules, the rules include a resident who doesn't want to work can still stay as long as they like with free food, showers, and have their bedding washed for them. I'm moving in. Okay, no. Ready? <laughs> Cheap rent. Yeah. Residents bringing in deadly weapons will have the weapons stored for them and then returned when they leave the shelter. The manager of the previous homeless shelter stated to the media after a three days dead body was found on the roof, the shelter is dangerous, this is his quote, and by no means is it safe. The shelter has been evaluated on several different occasions since it opened. It was evaluated as being understaffed, violently dangerous, and allowing the use of drugs and alcohol. For years, the city has also allowed hundreds of homeless campers to camp on the banks of the Truckee River, drinking the water supply and ruining the water supply in the Truckee River with no police interference, which is a direct violation of federal law. Homeless river campers have also been videotaped throwing gallons of human waste, liquid and solid, into uh, Truckee Meadows drinking water treatment ponds, okay? Uh, kind of disgusting question, and I'm gonna ask her first, okay? <laughs> Mayor, for right now, how would you evaluate Reno's homeless situation? Who or what is to blame? Is there, in fact, a shortage of services to help the homeless, including mental health services? Why is that? The more the sp city spends, the worse it continues to get. How would you fix the situation? Okay. I, I believe her quote was, she's proud of how they handled the homeless right. situation. Well, she didn't answer, so you're up. That's what she said. So, check, check, oh, thank you. Um, I can provide Hillary's answer and then you can respond. Does that sound good? Okay. Uh, 
When the new tent and shelter opened last year, uh, Mayor Sheev said the facility will have wraparound services to help battle mental health issues and addiction and get them back on their feet. Uh, she stated that Reno must have transitional housing like this. Uh, the mayor stated, we need more treatment centers for addiction and mental health. The ones we have currently are hard to access. The mayor also stated, people sleeping along the Truckee River is not safe, and we can no longer allow that to happen. It is dangerous. It is a public safety ha hazard. Removing them is long overdue. Well, as a matter of fact, this council before approved armed guards at the, at the uh, homeless center. And then guess what? At 7 o'clock, they turn them loose on the street. So how safe do you feel now as this problem is multiplied by 10 through the years? So we need to do something about this. And I've been right. Go look at my history and my website. For the last 12 years, I said the county and all the elected officials in here know I said it. The county is responsible for all social issues to place and pay for. They get the money and funding to do so. And if I'm elected in Reno, that's who I'm going to represent. So we're 77 million through time in this thing, and it serves, there's 1,800 to 2,000 people. We put some numbers together with me and some friends. So they serve 1,800 people now, and we spent $77 million on it, and it's a county issue. But now, as of a couple months ago, guess who's paying? The county, just like I said. So I was right on that and would have save the people that I represent $77 million plus the issue wouldn't have multiplied by 10. And then beside that point, then you go into the SPCA, they spend $14 million on animals and $9 million on 120,000 seniors. How does that make you feel as they're closing senior centers? So I think they have it bass awkward, so to speak, to where I'm going to represent my seniors in quality of life and we're not going to be buying fancy art pieces from our friends. So that's what I'm going to do. All right, part two. Part two of the homelessness is financial and safety impact. Comprising less than 1% of Reno's population, the homeless have a disproportionately negative uh, financial and quality of life impact on city services. Public safety workers in Reno say that the 1% of the population that is homeless account for 40% or more of emergency service calls and a similar proportion of the crimes that are committed. The Reno Fire Department responds to anywhere from three to five calls per day to put out fires caused by illegal homeless campers. Each of these calls cost thousands of dollars to respond to. The question that I have, and then I'll give Hillary's written response. Do you feel that this is just a problem Reno has to live with? Or as mayor, would you have a plan of solving it? Now, Hillary's response was, Mayor Sheevy has repeatedly said that the city of Reno cannot fix this problem by themselves. She believes we have to have our regional partners to tackle this. That's the city of Sparks, Washoe County, and the city of Reno. She believes that we all have to come together and do it together with a consolidated effort. So now, Eddie, your response. Thank you. Well, like I said, I'm gonna be involved in city issues. It's police, fire, and public works. We're gonna get more police on the streets. We're gonna enforce the law equally. And then we're gonna make the county more accountable for what their issue is. And so since it's multiplied in Reno, you know too, but I have a big heart. That's why I looked at it at first. And that's the thing is, put yourself in their shoes for a moment, okay? If you're in a tent across the street from the homeless shelter, you get your check. And then there's alcohol, drugs, food, lodging, everything within a block, gaming, 
too much stimulation, they blow every dime, they don't get out of that situation. That's why if I'd have been mayor the last eight years, we certainly wouldn't be in this position because they would have had it in the county near a bus line. I think without all that stimulation, they're more apt to get help and get out of that situation because I'm the type that believes in a hand up, not a handout, and I think there's mental health issues that the state should step in and everyone needs to be evaluated separately because everybody's needs are different, but that's going to be for the county to unwind because nationwide the county's responsible for that and not Eddie Lorton being the mayor of Reno if I'm lucky enough to be and I'm going to focus on our issues and they need to focus on theirs. So that's how I'll handle this issue. Okay, um, the Downtown Business Improvement District is the next topic. I learned a little bit today when I was doing some of the research as well. Um, about four years ago, uh, the Reno City Council, led by Mayor Sheevy, voted to approve a business improvement district, otherwise known as a BID. Since then, the BID has been operated by a private entity named the Downtown Reno Partnership. Uh, that is a private nonprofit downtown management organization. Uh, According to the website, the Reno website, which I'll quote, they work with businesses, property owners, residents, city and county government to make the core of the city cleaner, safer and friendlier with the ultimate goal of creating a vibrant downtown area, attracting tourists and new business owners. Overall, by providing the above services, the BID will help stabilize downtown streets by improving safety, addressing homelessness, enhancing cleanliness, and activating public spaces. In addition, it will help foster additional activity for existing businesses, attract new investment in businesses to downtown, and act as a champion by aligning existing groups to speak with a single unified voice on behalf of downtown. I take that directly from the Reno website. It is understood that downtown business owners pay certain fees to this organization. Uh, this organization employs a variety of folks who are called ambassadors. Um, the fiscal budget for 2022, which is published on the Reno website in 2023, from the BID shows about a $3.9 million income statement and a $3.4 million expense statement. Uh, during the uh, creation of the BID, there was much disagreement about whether or not to improve it, and you were one of the most outspoken critics of it, and uh, Mayor Shibi was a supporter of it. Um, I will give you Shibi's statement of her support, and then you can uh, address the BID. Uh, Mayor Shibi said at the time, that, um, after, after the BID was approved by the council, that it would work so well that people would not recognize downtown Reno within a few years. She said the BID, and I quote, was truly a game changer for downtown, that it would raise property values, create a cleaner downtown, and enhance future growth. Question, in your opinion, how has the business improvement district worked and has it accomplished what it promised in downtown Reno? Hate to tell them, but it was a disaster and failure, just like the scooters program. So, let's get into this right now. Okay, I was against it. It's a business improvement district. What they did, even the city took advocated for this. They sent you a notice if you were a property owner, and this notice stated, because I'm a property owner in the downtown core, and it acted like one property, one voice, so a majority vote till you go to the meeting, and I'm quite involved. I know what they do and how they do it. I've been going to, for 30 years to protect my investments. I know the system better than all of them. So then what you do, you go there, and they act like one man, one vote, show up, share your voice. So I said, okay, I went. Then all of a sudden, once you went to the meeting, you know what they did? Then they turned it into the three biggest property owners, the El Dorado, the hospital, and another one, and they decided for everybody. 
So that was terrible. So these three wanted it because you know what all we did? We paid into this business improvement district so they did an assessment on your properties. That's how you had to pay into this. There's apartments that pay a whole bunch that are downtown into this improvement district and all we need to do is hire a few more cops, wait till one of these ambassadors get a beat down and we get sued. And the city gets sued all the time and lose millions of dollars every time we get sued. So I was against this BID because if you don't get service through that BID, I own stuff on 4th Street. We never see any of them. All they were was a group to give private security to the hospital in Coranos on our expense, or excuse me, the Caesars group now. I want to take that back. They, they bought them out down there at the casinos. So we give them private security. We're all paying for it. And some of the old people that owned it are on the board. And then guess what? Then all of a sudden, Naomi Jarden, that's another interesting move lately. I hope we get into a point soon and she ended up stepping down because the other guy that was a complete failure he failed in San Jose brought it here our homeless increased by 10 and now he's moving on to somewhere else but Naomi Jordan took on this 200 and some thousand dollar a year job and stepped out of the council she voted on this for the BID and then took the highest paying job and said see you later because they see us coming so that BID is a failure it's private security for the casinos downtown and we're all paying for it so I'm against fleecing the taxpayer and we're gonna put more money into police and let them do their job so this nonsense isn't going on thank you thank you Eddie uh, I'm gonna get right now into leadership and health uh, if you will emergencies at the direction of Mayor Sheevy most of Reno was shut down or severely limited for two years during the COVID outbreak Reno's response to this health emergency was far more extreme and lasted much longer than that of many other Nevada communities. Numerous Reno businesses were forced to close because of Reno's excessively tight restrictions. It included making City Hall almost totally inaccessible personally and maintained Zoom council meetings longer than any other city in Nevada. During this time, the mayor made almost zero personal appearances. Question, how do you feel about how the COVID emergency in Reno was handled? What do you think could or should have been handled differently? What do you think is the role of the mayor in health emergencies? Hillary's response, Mayor Sheevy, was she stated that she is proud that Reno was the first city in Nevada to shut down during COVID. Anybody want me to repeat that? Okay. She says uh, she thought it was the right thing to do. The mayor said that the shutdown was hard on her own personal business as well. Mayor Sheevy says that due to many personal challenges, 2020 was the most difficult year of her life. How was it for you, George Eddie Lorton? I'm glad you asked, Eddie. So let's get to it. First off, I would never close our businesses and churches through mandates. Her businesses never closed one day. It was one of the necessary businesses selling clothes over there. How's that make you feel? Why businesses are closing, we're suffering. The mayor disappears for two years till an election comes and she pops out of the cake, running against term limits, by the way, and I set case law on term limits, Lorton versus Jones in 14. But right now, the way that the judges are deciding, we're gonna have to beat her at the ballot box so it gets dirtier than that. So imagine when she jumped the gun with the county and the city of Sparks and said, oh, we're closing down in the casinos too. Then she got the phone call from the casinos, everybody but them. So she just does what they tell her to do, scramble around the city of Sparks made a statement, the county made a statement, you're not our boss, we're staying open. Until then her friend Sisolak came out of the woodwork and then they closed everybody. And by the way too, we looked into uh, some of the COVID money Hillary ended up, she claimed she had 14 or 15 employees there, and we have the bank statement, she had $164,000, $160,000 from the PPE money and stayed open the whole time, and she's the mayor collecting that salary and never showed up. 
So that's what you're dealing with. If she's the mayor and I'm going to do a much better job, I will not close us for mandates. I believe in freedom. If you want to ride your convertible in a mask, you're free to do so or sit in your car alone in a mask. But if you don't want to wear a mask, you should be free to do that. And if you want a shot, get a shot. And if you don't want a shot, you shouldn't have to get a shot. So that's where I stand, okay? Thanks for that, Eddie. Okay. We've got a couple more questions here, and then what we'll do is we'll go to the audience questions, and I've split them up, and I'll give you, yeah, a few. Mm -hmm. uh, building, planning, and affordable housing, another hot topic. Yes. Led by Mayor Sheeby, the council is currently overseeing two uh, major building projects and several smaller ones. The Jacobs Entertainment Company has been working under a contract with the city of Reno for several years on what is expected to be over a $1 billion West Reno development. They have raised uh, hundreds of low-income ap apartments. Um, they have yet to build anything while receiving over $10 million in published uh, incentives from the council, uh, although Mayor Shibi has denied that. Uh, the Reno Experience District, Red Development, in the Plum and Virginia area, consists of thousands of in-progress high-rise apartments and businesses with a population density that many residents um, have questions, both, uh, or excuse me, many residents question um, the ability to fight fires in these buildings, as well as the neighborhood's ability to handle what will be an exponential increase in traffic. The issue of affordable housing um, has also become somewhat uh, contentious. Uh, with an average Reno income of $50,000, an average apartment rent uh, is almost $1,700 a month. The average Reno residents would have to spend well over 50% of their take-home pay in rent. Uh, the question, uh, do you believe that this is just a problem Reno um, is going to have to live with? Or as mayor, is there a solution to perhaps solve it? Um, and I will just simply read uh, Hillary's public statements on affordable housing and the issues. Uh, uh, mayor Shevey has uh, repeatedly stated uh, that the city of Reno cannot fix the problems uh, simply by themselves. She believes that we have to have uh, regional partners um, to tackle affordable housing and, and um, developments. Um, the city of Sparks, uh, Washoe County, and the city of Reno would be the regional partners. Um, and she believes that it would take a consolidated effort. Hold on, did I read that right? Excuse me. I feel like I just repeated a question that... Ah, I'm sorry. I reread the wrong answer. <laughs> Forgive me, Mayor Shevey. <laughs> This is her response, I had the wrong. Um, so how would you evaluate the current situation regarding Reno's building plans and projects? And do you think the government should intervene um, in to construct low-income housing? So Hillary's response uh, and her stated uh, public statements, uh, we know housing is the leading challenge in our city. Uh, Mayor Hillary Sheevey has said our staff created a bold plan that has helped speed up new housing. Uh, the mayor has also said that affordable housing is a major issue and that one we all need to work together to tackle. Uh, mayor Shebe has also said that uh, the city needs more tenants' rights and penalties for predatory landlords. Uh, mayor Shebe has also said that she is proud of what the city has accomplished, but there is still more that can and needs to be done. Uh, she claims that she has not offered any builders any subsidies. Uh, the council has also made the builders pay, or, excuse me, pay fair market value for all the properties. Mayor Shevey says that the Jacobs Entertainment Development Project in West Reno is doing great, and people who say otherwise are guilty of spreading fake news. Um, Shevey says the Jacobs Project will revitalize the city, help people, and change lives. That's interesting. So now, go look at her C&E reports. That's your cash and expense reports. See where her money comes from. The casinos and developers. 
and she's in their pockets. As you'll see, the number one lobbyist for developers in the casinos in the city is Jessica Sferraza, okay? Then look what Jenny Breckis did to her on that loop to where she says she knows her, but it's not gonna affect her vote. And she's the only lobbyist I've seen that goes in front of the city, never speaks, and has a 100% closing ratio. How about that? They're making a fortune off this town, fleecing us. They get sewer connection fees forgiven. One project over by the river, they got off $250,000 for one. They found new ways to subsidize developers. Go back and look at Reno land development. Jessica Sferraza, and look all this up. It's the facts. And the Reno land development over there at the Park Lane Mall project got a subsidy of $3.6 million out of your sewer fund. It's a billionaire. Michael Milk and the junk bond salesman from the lake owns Reno land development. So they didn't do traffic studies. They blew it through, and they subsidized them. $3.6 million out of your sewer fund, and your sewer bill goes up 10% a year because we're subsidizing these developers. And in your research, you've seen some of the subsidies. And all they've done, they've given them land that they sold over at the Jacobs group and then I was guilty at, in 2018 I called her the bulldozer queen because they had a picture of her on the front page of the paper and the bulldozer tearing down the affordable housing hence adding to the homeless issue so they tore down the affordable housing as we have empty lots sitting on our city streets while our town has a homeless issue, law enforcement issues, so they are definitely in the pocket of developers. That's not true. They subsidize them all the time. How about how they sold $55 million worth of bonds for the Stonegate project? Now, I'm going to make the developers pay their way. Back in 08, they ended up for a sewer connection fee. It used to be 15000 And in 08, when we had a correction, it went down to 10000 Now that we're in an upswing, they never upped the connection fee. They're not paying their way they let them off a lot of fees all the time for growth and now that's how we get four level apartment complexes in your backyard they don't know what infill means it means like on like so in midtown they'll have a four level apartment complex because they're in their pockets with zero parking requirements yes they're just throwing it in but my plan for affordable housing is this i just had to put a little substance behind it before I got to it. So now my plan is this, so probably they'll, you know, on four I did this in the interview, you'll hear it here and they'll probably implement it next week and claim it for their own. So my idea is this, we will never do high density apartment complexes or approve them unless 25% of them are affordable, which will be defined by the Reno Housing Authority. Hence, it's not gonna be on your shoulders and backs, it's gonna be on the developer's backs, and then they're not gonna be greedy anymore. So that's what I'm gonna do for my plan, and they can do 25% according to Reno Housing Authority, and that's what they'll have to do before we approve the project. So that's my plan for affordable housing. All right. Um, when I was looking over the council meeting notes um, today, and it might behoove you to do so, um, the Reno City Council published a graph which showed that affordable housing has actually decreased, or at least the amount of units have decreased um, over the past seven years. Um, and it's decreased at about, I want to say it's about 450 to 500 units. So much for that plan. Not mine, hers. Real quick comment, if you own a car and you live near Plum in Virginia, sell it, okay? You're not gonna be able to use it once the development opens up. That's just a personal opinion. And I'm not running for anything except the edge of town. Okay, here we <laughs> go. You. Reno's economy. Reno's economy is at a critical juncture. Between 2014 and 2019, Reno ranks second in the nation in job growth, according to Millican Institute's annual survey of top performing cities. In the last 12 month period, Reno has fallen from second to 106 in this category. For overall economic performance, Reno dropped from fourth place to 18th place. Factors contributing to this are Reno's lack of wage growth, job growth and affordable housing. Reno's performance ran in the opposite direction of most mid-sized cities in the Inner Mountain region who 
improved in all of these areas. Reno's economy continues to grow with the overall average wage sitting at almost $30 an hour and tech and logistics jobs starting uh, to reduce Reno's over-reliance on employment in the hospitality and gaming sectors. Question, how do you feel about Reno's current economy and future economic outlook as mayor? How will you continue to grow and diversify our economy, increase wages and employment opportunities, and help businesses find enough employees? Her response, the mayor said, at uh, the Reno Economic Future, she is what she said, the Reno's, was this the mayor or President Biden? I'm not sure. Okay, the mayor said that Reno's economic future is bright. With the COVID shutdown behind us, Reno's economy is recovering and will continue to recover as our city attracts more diverse companies as our tech and logistics sectors keep growing and as we continue to attract skilled workers from California. That was her response. I now would like your response, Eddie. George Eddie Lorton. Thank you, sir. Well, I'm a highly seasoned business person, so I will get us cleaned up. People will be attracted right off the bat because we're going to have a safe, clean atmosphere in our downtown core, but Reno is so much more than downtown as well. Like when we end up, you know, most of our services go to the homeless shelter. You can't get a cop across town, and we're going to hire more police. We're going to clean this place up. We're going to be business friendly. You know, most people have a hard time getting business licenses in the city of Reno, so they go to Sparks or somewhere else because they make it so impossible. You talk to two different people, you get two different answers. So if you talk to someone, they're treating you right, write the name down and ask for them the next time. So I'm going to make us more business friendly, and we will be business diverse, but that code thing was a tragedy and they stayed closed so long they I excuse my language raped and pillaged us because they stayed closed they approved more developments than ever I have industrial property they devaluated my industrial property over by Valley Road and 4th Street because they approved to have um, residential right there in an industrial area so it devaluated it so certain businesses you can't put in within a thousand feet so it's poor planning on every aspect of it on what we're going to do we welcome all businesses and that means keep taxes low they're trying to increase property taxes and they have a what they call a lobbyist that works for the city of Reno and they have a thing called BDRs bill draft requests and they're going to send them in to try to get your property taxes increased which will make the area less beneficial for people to come and move here where we'll be business friendly we'll supply jobs we'll clean up our city and that alone and quit giving subsidies why would these people work they hand them money and stuff like that so there's no incentive you know I had nothing I did it with this and these from the ground up. Good hard work gets you everything. That's the American dream. So everybody has the opportunity to go out and make that dream. So we're going to make it wide open. I'll have an open door policy. If you have problems at the city of Reno, you come see Eddie Lorton. We'll go down and straighten it out for you. We'll get your business up and running. So you'll be happy to do business in the city of Reno. So that's the difference between her and I. Thank you. George. Eddie Floyd, do you have one more question left on there, or am I uh, the I last do. question? Okay, okay, okay. Well, I just want... Well, you, you have one, yeah, too, don't you? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. And I think this is going to be one of um, George Eddie Lorton's favorite questions, because we're going to talk about city council appointments. <laughs> and he has, he has to do that. Um, so yesterday, um, they approved a new council member. Again. Uh, Yesterday, Reno City Council members interviewed four candidates to fill the Ward 3 Council position and selected Miguel Martinez for the appointment. The mayor and all council members, with the exception of council member Jenny Breckus, voted in favor of appointing Martinez. Breckus voted against the selection, stating that she didn't believe the ward seat should be filled by an appointment because the appointee would feel that they owed something to the members who appointed them. That was the latest on that. Um, there have been uh, now, I guess, four, four appointments in the last four years, correct? Four appointments? Um, 
many of the city council members have resigned before their elected terms were completed. Um, all the times the council voted to appoint their replacements rather than have an election. In all instances, the council voted in replacement council members um, who are seemingly aligned uh, with the mayor's office. Uh, this gave and gives the replacements uh, an advantage of incumbency. Um, and what's interesting about this too is Henderson, which um, is adjacent to Las Vegas, does the same exact thing. <laughs> so maybe they're sister cities. Um, Mayor Shivi and Eddie Lorton have typically been on opposite sides of this issue. Uh, Mayor Shivi traditionally making an argument uh, by justifying appointments and uh, George Eddie Lorton in favor of elections. Um, Hillary's response, or at least Hillary's um, public statements to appointments, uh, is said, has said that she would like to elect replacements for unexpired council terms, but it is difficult because it takes a long time to schedule an election and it is expensive. Um, Shivi has also said, Mayor Shivi has also said that she wouldn't want to see any ward in the city go many months without representation. Uh, the mayor has also said the council would be criticized no matter which way they chose to fill the unexpired term. If the council waited to have an election, people would complain about months without representation as well as the cost of the special election. If the council picked a replacement, um, Shivi said, the public would then say the council is corrupt. So in, in essence, it's a no-win situation. Um, what is your response to um, the election appointments, or excuse me, the council appointments rather than election? Boy, she covered her bases, got all sides of the fence, didn't she? So now, I'll, I'll put it this way. Like last time, the appointment, not, not yesterday or today, the previous one. This is what they do with these people. They did it with Bobsy and Devin Reese, this Taylor and this new guy. They appoint their yes person, give them the fake gift of incumbency, and then they help them at the next election to keep the machine going, and they take it out of the public's hands. I'm not for that. You should be elected in elected position, not appointed like you're a committee member. So they took it out of your hands so they could get their yes person in. And then I know the system, so you know what I did? Like last time, out of 40-some people, they chose three for the finalist. So I go to the CNE report. Every single one of them gave Hillary Sheevy money. Oh, and it's not their yes person? Come on, give me a break. And one of them that they chose was on the planning commission and votes hand in hand with Hillary and the whole group. So be smarter than they are. See what they're doing to you as they put a lipstick on a pig, so to speak. Know what they're doing to you. So I believe in electing and elected positions. And then they mentioned that part about ineffective. Give me a break. Jenny Breckis hasn't had a voice for four or five years. What's it going to be for a couple months? That's going to do the people right. Uh, her ward has zero voice. And so it would take a couple months. And all it costs us, last time when they said it would only cost, because usually it's only a single ward. They don't have to do a city ride race, ride race like the at-large of the mayors. It's only that one little district. So they said it would be about 105000 They spend more than that on beach whales. So I think, sorry about that. We had to have fun while we're here. But the thing is, is while we're at it, let's keep the people in politics. Let them elect who they want representing them instead of more of these people that are destroying this town. So that's why I've been an advocate. I live here. I don't like what this city has turned into. So if you can't beat them, join them, beat them. And if you want something done right, do it yourself. So that's that's why they should have elections. Thank you for that. Thank you, Eddie. All right. This is my last question. Yes. Okay. Yes. And then we'll go to the um, questions from the audience. Perfect. Okay. Okay. It is not as easy as it should be to find consistent information about Reno's budget, debt load, and financial condition. Within Reno City Hall, the answers vary greatly. 
Several years ago, a high-ranking supervisor in Reno's budgeting department made the following statement to an independent journalist, it's of record, our council and mayor do not understand that the hundreds of millions of dollars that Reno is committed to for unfunded pension liability, ARE, in fact, is part of the city's debt. Question for the mayor and then for George Eddie Lorton, what do you understand to be the current amount of Reno's total indebtedness? And as mayor, how would you plan to reduce and eliminate this out of control deficit spending and maintain balanced annual budgets? Her response was, under my leadership, the city has paid down over $240 million of debt and millions more of unfunded pension liability. Our city's credit rating has increased. I have taken steps in all areas to make our city government more efficient, more cost effective, and more accountable. We are always looking for ways to save money. Your turn, George Eddie Lorton. I'm a forensics auditor. I know what they do. You heard of bait and switch? These people didn't act like part of the PERS were part of their debt. They say it's a liability, so they separate debt from liability and don't take it on and include it. If I have a liability, that's a debt. We're writing checks for it. This city has two things called its complicated forbearance agreements. Goldman Sachs financed the trench. We put that in for the casinos. We're still millions and millions, hundreds of millions in debt for that trench, and they put it off every year at a higher interest rate, and they've done these forbearance agreements on it, so they don't consider that debt, but we still owe it. So they don't include the forbearance agreements debt, they don't include the PERS debt, and guess what? The unfunded liabilities for the sewer aren't included either, Eddie. And guess what? Every time there's an election cycle, because they try to break up the financing different and they don't itemize it, then they say a few years back, every time before they said we had an $11 million surplus, the other year they had a $4 million surplus probably at the last meeting, and they fired the finance manager because she wouldn't play ball, and you can look it up. On the Gazette Journal, she got fired during the finance hearings where they gave this new city manager a $100,000 a year raise. So I know this stuff, and they just have no clue whatsoever what's going on. We're a billion dollars in debt, and the only way that we still they still keep going is because in the Constitution, look that up, you can't file bankruptcy if you're a city entity. So a long time ago when they misspent sewer funds, they ended up stating that if they did it again, they did it at the ballpark over there. They misspent sewer uh, funds on that little bus stop they had before they moved it. And then the state came in and said, you do that again, because at any time they can take the city over. That would have been the be as corrupt as these people are. That would have been the best thing that ever happened to this city. So instead, they let it go, and then they spent the $3.6 million on the Reno Land Development Project, more city funds that per NRS 278B, it clearly states, sewer funds can only be used to increase sewer capacity, not for storm drains. So they broke the law again. We did an, an open meeting law complaint to Adam Laxalt at the time. He took so long to decide on it. I wasn't happy on this one. And then, yes, I was right, but he just slapped their hand and didn't go into the fact they illegally spent your sewer fund money subsidizing a billionaire. So let's go. Okay, so I have, if you would pass these down, we have four questions apiece. Um, uh, we'll just kind of go back and forth, and these are coming from y'all, so thank you very much. Um, I'll start. Um, please ask their position, and I will send these questions to Hillary's office as well, okay? Um, so we can try to get some answers from her, so please give me the three by five cards, Eddie, when you're done with those. Um, please ask their position on accessory dwelling units, ADUs. Okay, well, I believe in like and like. So a lot of people, what they're doing before in different parts of town, people were mad about it because they would put little units in their backyard for you know, their mom or dad or grandparent. If it's under control and it's a smaller unit, 
I think it should be allowed. And they fought it for a long time, but I don't want to, hey, they're putting in four level apartment complexes in your backyard in Midtown. What's a tiny little accessory unit if your loved one lives there? So I just want to make sure that the laws would be followed. It wouldn't be rent to unsavory, so to speak. People that are ripping in and out and then they're using it for income. If it's family members, yes, and but small units, I don't believe in big units or two level units or any of that. So you don't bother the neighborhood complexion of what people bought into, but yet too with this housing crunch, families need to, you know, times evolve and I'm for that. Sometimes you have to move family members near or with you. And man, if, if we had to move one of our parents in, boy, I'd rather have them in their own separate little unit in the back so I could check on them than, than have them roaming around the house naked. So that's what I would believe in. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right. Next question. Not if, when elected. How soon can you add police staffing to Reno? As quick as I can. First thing I'll do because Jason's leaving, is have a meeting with the new chief and see which laws that they need in place to deal with our homeless issues and any ideas that they have. Because, you know, I don't claim to be an expert in everything, but I have learned this in my business career. You bring in the experts, you listen to all the advice, and then you do what you think is best. So we'll bring in the police since that's their job, where I have a few suggestions to make. Like, notice, I want more police on the streets. You'll see them on Sunday drive, and you'll see a car every 10 feet on Sunday morning. But when the crime's happening, I want to put walking patrols downtown when the crime's happening because a sheer presence prevents crime and that's how i see it so we'll have a discussion on what my common sense tells me and what he says and and we'll come up with a good plan and we'll quit all these subsidies and with me in there i've been to court numerous times i have a lot of businesses to where we're going to get sued a lot less too here they are they got sued in lemon valley for building in a flood plain and then daybreak they approved after they all got giant contributions and you can look at their c &E report devin reese got the most out of all of them and they got giant donations and they built in another floodplain after just being sued for being built in the floodplain. Verdi's suing them now. Mr. Browart sued them for me. I mean, it's just nonstop. So me preventing lawsuits by doing things legal and right will save us millions alone. We cut the subsidies out, sell off some city-owned properties like the ballroom the casinos are using for free and we're paying for it. That's why the casinos don't like me. That's why the developers don't like me because I'm going to work for you. So we will manage our money and put more police on the streets through all that business acclimate that we built through the years. Thank you. Okay, next question. Um, is Doris L. King still in the room? Oh, darn it. Okay. Um, this was his concern, and I don't know that he wrote this question, but he's running for, I believe, Assembly District 24, I think. Um, how do you plan to help families keep their children safe from gangs? Wow, that's interesting. Uh, well, for one, everything I can do. So by cutting crime down, you know, that's just it. You know, people label you Republican or Democrat. I'll tell you something. Jenny Breckis wouldn't have won last time if I didn't help her. She only won by 85 votes, and I told my friends she votes right. Help her. So I don't care if you're Democrat or Republican. That's why, too, reaching out across the aisle at times, if it makes sense to you, you can get stuff done. So when it comes to crime and cutting down crime alone will help this situation, and we need, we need more, stronger police presence and then these certain gang units in place so they can bust them and then try to help them and programs, which I said before, the county is responsible for. And, you know, they say there's no public health and stuff, but I reached out to a guy that's helping in the homeless situation now. He's saying there's all kinds of programs and you can get in people quickly. So I'm not sure about the truth on that, but I will get to the bottom of it and we'll do what we need to do so that we can help quality of life issues and spend our money on proper things instead of these frivolous things they spend them on. So that's a promise. So we can start curtailing this problem. I would never let a kid starve. I don't want women to feel like they don't have a safe place to go when they're in trouble, if it's our responsibility at all, because we got to take care of families. Me and my family, like 
here's my wife Christy here. We've, we've been through a lot. You know, you put everything out there when you're running for office. You give a lot of your time. You're putting signs out. It's hard on your family. You're open for criticism. We do this because we love this place. And we want to include this town in our family. I've lived here my whole life. I'm 60 years old, and it's a shell of the town that I used to live in. So everything I can do to try to change it back to how we used to be and where people smiled and helped yeah. each other, that's what I'm going to do. So we will try to curtail that problem. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, George, Eddie, sorry. Thank you, Okay, sir. this question is from Ray Rocha, so bear with me. It's uh, <laughs> before or after his Irish coffee. Yeah, that's right. This is before, Thank God. and it was actually directed to the mayor, and he says, and I'm going to have you respond after I hear silence, where do you get the legal authority to declare Reno a sanctuary city? I hear nothing, so you're up, Eddie. Yeah, well, they voted on it, and then after that, those people were murdered on Zalesi Lane by illegals. So this is my stance on it. I don't care though. I don't care if you come from Germany or France or the Arctic Pole. I want you here legally. So it has nothing to do with any race, color, creed. We're all brothers and sisters, but you're going to do your. Why would people do it legally if they can just jump across? So our city always does little tricks, and if you aren't paying attention, you don't see what's going on. Instead of sanctuary city, they did the code word a welcoming city, Eddie. So I don't believe in these little codes and trying to skirt the public. I mean, you elect these people hoping they're going to represent you and do what's best for you. Little do you know, that's why they had their council meetings during the day. Plus, they had pre-caucus meetings to discuss how they were going to vote at the meeting, where if I am lucky enough to be elected in office, we're going to stop the caucus meetings. Everything I can say will be in front of you because I'm going to be transparent. I won't want to say anything that I can't say in front of you. So... That's what we'll do, Eddie. No Thank welcoming you. city or sanctuary, whatever new word they come up with. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Came up with a new word. They would. Okay. Um, and whatever, in, I should you be elected? Um, and if you have a solution for this, I want you to call me in Vegas so I can take this to Spread Vegas. Spread it around. Yes. Um, if elected, can you do anything about the unpleasant smell of all the pot dispensaries downtown? <laughs> Well, I think that, you know, the thing is, it's legal now, so I don't know why they put them downtown and not out in the country somewhere, because everyone knows it smells, but I think they should have better filtration systems so that that might, especially in different areas, you have to analyze everything. I look from a business perspective, I reverse engineer things. If they're in the middle of town, of course, they need more filtration systems and if you're out in the country somewhere so they need to do a case-by-case -case basis study what is needed so people aren't complaining about that and you know and I understand that so smell sometimes like our assessor Mike Clark mentioned you know like out in Lemon Valley now they have smells okay that are out there and it smells like a cesspool and they're going to devaluate some of their property values for them and lower their taxes so but but they're not smelling skunk smells they're smelling like human waste smell so that's why we need to take care of these issues, look out for those that live there, and I'm business friendly by all means, but you have to look at the overall effect on what it does when you approve things. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, next question comes from Kathy Cooper in the audience right now, and it says, there are so many people coming to live here in Reno, and not a happy face, but an unhappy face, she wrote, what should or could we be doing to address the impact of all these newbies when it comes to housing, schools, roads, native wildlife, plants, and traffic? Boy, they want everything. Are yeah. we going to hear Hillary's answer? He's running for mayor, not mind? president. Well, I'm gonna, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send all these questions to Mayor Sheev in her office, um, and hopefully she, she will respond in kind. But we don't have any... Um, prepared responses from her because they're impromptu questions. Because she's not here. Well, that too. Hiding Hillary. Didn't make it. <laughs> um, oh, did you? So, oh, yeah. Now, so it was more of the kind of uh, affordable housing question all over again. Where me, I don't care where you come from, 
but don't drag it here and don't forget why you left. So people are gonna come from other places. If I do a speech and I'm in a room, most of the time, see who's native here. You will have two or three hands. It's unreal how many people were born in Nevada. So you welcome them in, but yet too, we're gonna do the best we can, but there is a point where I'm gonna reverse engineer. If we don't have water or infrastructure, we're gonna do a moratorium on building. You just have to do it. Our, we have to do what our resources can handle. Quit letting the developers get off without paying their part on new police stations, fire stations, parks, most of the time they used to put those in. Now they let them get away with it. They put the infrastructure in, then they donate it back to the city. That's commonplace on what our old procedures were. So I'm just gonna make it to where it's a great place to live. I wanna keep our open space, but I don't wanna overdevelop it and turn us into LA to where we have a smog bowl. And you know, the way we're designed here with all the mountains, we're more apt for that than LA is. So I will, I believe in controlled, responsible growth, not what's going on now while they're in the developer's pockets. So that's what I will do different. Thank you. Do you have one more question, Eddie? Okay. Go All right, ahead. I'll end with this question then, okay? Um, I've got one here. It, okay. It's it's due to, I'll, I'll just read it really quick. Okay. It's regard to, I, and I think it's similar, so it's it might have already been answered, but this is from Gary Haste, I think it is, Hast. Uh, with regard to multifamily projects, could we concentrate on condos instead of rentals, uh, increasing uh, home ownership? It's probably less monthly cost over renting. Give the prospective new owners information on how to qualify. You want my answer? <laughs> well, that would be nice. <laughs> well, that's kind of outside the city scope. We approve what the developer's project is, and then um, it's up to people, because you know, another thing, I've never invested in condos, you know why? Because then they have HOA fees, and then by the time you're done with their HOA fees, and then you think you're locked into a payment, everything's comfortable, they keep raising it on you. So little do they know unless they get into it and they start looking into what a condo really costs. Sometimes, you know, that would be great, and if you prefer that and you don't want to do yard work and stuff, it's a great thing. But, but it's, it's, it's six of one, half a dozen of another, and so you approve what developers do, but I can't push projects. The developers are free, because uh, I do believe in property rights. I want to be clear on that. And so if it's needed, we'll do it. If it's not, we won't. If it comes to condos or affordable housing, but these giant atrocities that they're building, like the one you mentioned over there at Plum Lane with no, no uh, traffic study is unbelievable like they're doing in Midtown. Four level units right in the middle of your backyard looking down in your house and there's no parking study. Where do they park? In everybody else's spots. So we're not gonna do that. We're gonna do controlled responsible growth and let developers do what they're gonna do and we suit it for the area. So that's the best I can do because my job is police, fire, and public works, right. okay? Thank you. And this is the last question from the audience, and then we'll go to public statements. Um, we did pull, or excuse me, find a closing statements. Um, we did pull a, a closing statement for uh, Hillary Shivi uh, off of her uh, campaign website. Okay. Very good. Okay, final question, and uh, can't get to all of them. Sorry, but this is from Gloria Charlene. She says, and and maybe not quite in the mayor's purview, but what do you think about the CDC voting 15 to zero to add COVID vaccine to childhood vaccine schedule? Okay, what would you do to stop censorship around what is really in the COVID vaccine and help? others with the vaccine who have been injured well like i said do you know how many more deaths occurred during covid locking people up through depression and drug addiction and drinking and they don't count that in their statistics where i believe in freedom you want to get the shot get the shot i don't think the kids should have to get the covid shots okay i think that should be up to the parents and if they want to give their kids a shot, fine. I think our school boards, too, actually have to focus more on teaching instead of politics. So I think there's a lot of things wrong with the system. But, but two, there are some bright spots, and I want to focus on those. But then, two, you can't force things on people. 
That's what freedom is. It's my body, my choice till they turn around into a shot and then it's not your body, your choice anymore. So I'm not going to do reverse messaging on you. I'm going to be right and real and I won't be controlling that because I'm not a member of the CDC and I will keep my job straight. I have an opinion on things but my job will be once again police, fire, public works. I'm going to stick to that. Not make, make us a micro mobility city with scooters when we have all time high murder rates. We have not only the most dangerous city in the state, we have the most highest per capita homeless rate as well in Reno over Vegas even. So that's what I'm going to focus on, not global warming as they keep building and putting asphalt down, which adds to global warming, but it's okay if you're not catching that part of global warming. So I'm going to focus on what our needs are so we can move forward, clean the place up, and stop with the things that shouldn't even be of concern for their little special interests. So that's what I'll do. Okay, so closing statements and... Uh, I will read uh, Hillary's statement, and again, we pulled this off of her campaign website, so I'm not putting wor words in her mouth. Um, Reno has a bright future. U.S. News World, excuse me, U.S. News and World Report just ranked Reno as the ninth best place to live in the U.S. We can expect Washington, D.C. to save us from our challenges. We can't hide from them. Our city and our partners have been implementing a winning strategy to deal with homelessness and affordable housing. We are creating a more stable and secure city budget that will result in a cleaner and brighter Reno than ever before. And then your closing statement, please. Well, I've seen the plans. I've seen them over the last year. I'm gonna stand up for my closing statement, okay? Man, I've been sitting there a while. So now, We've seen what's occurred under this mayor and council's tenure under the last 10 years. I don't want any more to do with it. I want to move our city on. We've seen the results of all their tactful thinking where she probably didn't even write that statement. It was probably her assistant. He does all the work. I've never seen nothing like this. This mayor hired a city assistant that makes a hundred and some thousand a year. He does all the work. And before, I'm going to be the mayor, so we all won't need an assistant anymore. You have a volunteer assistant that helps a little bit, but they're not going to make a hundred grand a year to do your work. I'm going to be the mayor. And that's my promise to you. So I'm going to put more police on the streets, bring public safety back. When we have riots and the windows get kicked in, I'm not going to tell our police to stand down Why 28 officers get hurt and they go tag the police station. I believe in peaceful protests. You throw a brick, you're getting arrested. I'm going to deal with this homeless issue. Our 271,000 people aren't going to be held hostage for 1,800 people. Okay, I want to do the hand up, not a hand out, but I'm going to make sure our business owners, as they're closing them for COVID, you know how many people they put out of business and how much grief they've caused families? So I'm not going to do these things. I'm the exact opposite of her, pretty much, except for I'll be nice as well. She's nice. I'm going to be nice, but sometimes nice don't run cities. So you need someone with substance so we can take our city back. And another promise, I won't be in the pockets of developers. I mean, if you really knew and they put the lipstick on the pig we're back to that again everything's fine it's beautiful we can have pictures of sunsets kids running through the park go downtown and run through the park with your kids see what's really going on that's how out of touch these people are so I'm in touch I know what we need I live here I'm doing this because I care so on election day please tell 10 of your friends and everybody get out and vote so vote for George Eddie Lorton running for Reno mayor go to eddielorton.com if you have questions thanks for coming tonight I appreciate you thank you very much and thank you both thank, thank you. you Megan you're welcome thank you for coming everyone thank you all